Uh, we have uh, some participants with us on, on the Zoom platform and others are rather on Facebook. And, uh, but we are very, very thankful for the privilege to have our provost with us, Dr. Chris, Christian, Christian Arthur. And it will be the one uh, bringing greetings from the administration, offering the opening prayer and introducing our special guest for today. Dr. Arthur, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saturday. I'm, I'm, I'm honored and it's my great delight uh, to welcome each of you uh, to this evening's program. You know, decision making, it's, it's always a, a difficult thing and how, how, we, how we can incorporate data and pull from different sources. Uh, we, we try not to, to think about uh, data-driven decisions, but maybe mostly data-informed decisions. And I'm pleased that, that you're here this evening to be part of this, this great conversation. Um, wherever you are, locally, within the, the, the metropolis that we call Barron Springs, you know, we, we think of it that way in our minds at least. Uh, whether you're within the United States or Europe, some other parts of the world, Andrews has a reach that's, that's beyond the walls of our local campus. We welcome you and we thank you for being here. Let's pray. Our oh, Father, we, we are truly blessed to call you Father. You are with us. We see your guiding hands in our lives individually as well as collectively. We see your hands through Andrews University we see your hands through our church. And this evening, we pause to say thank you. Thank you for being such a good God to us. Uh, thank you for the gift of salvation. You've given that to each one of us fully and freely. And today, as two of our friends engage in discussions about decision making, we ask that your spirit will be with them and be with us as well as we participate. May your spirit guide and inform and enlighten our conversations. We Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm, I'm honored as well to, to have the, the privilege to introduce to you two daughters of Andrews University. Andrews has many children. Uh, last time we checked, Andrews has over 90,000 children. Wow. <laughs> and it's not going to stop. It's not going to stop. And just keep producing children. And two of them are here with us this evening. Uh, they, are, they are daughters of our university. Dr. Ella Lewis Smith Simmons and Dr. Lisa Beardsley Hardy. Let me take a moment and introduce them to you. <coughs> Members of our board at Andrews Board of Trustees, uh, Dr. Simmons completed her doctorate at the University of Louisville. And if you're from the South, you do say Louisville. Um, she's also the recipient of the Doctor Pedagogy Honoris Causa from Andrews University and a Master's from Andrews University, a true daughter of Andrews. She has completed three terms as a general vice president of the Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And in that capacity, she provides leadership education, administrative consultation, coaching and evaluation, and spiritual guidance to church leaders worldwide. And she serves on several general conference departments. Dr. Simmons chairs the Seventh-day Adventist International Board of Education, IBE, we call it sometimes, and the Board of Trustees of the Adventist International Institute of Advanced Studies, IS, in the Philippines. She's also the, the chair of the board of the University Council of the Adventist University of Africa, AUA. Uh, she serves as vice chairperson several committees and boards at the general conference. 
the International Board of Ministerial and Theological Education, the Adventist Accrediting Association, the Adventist Development and Relief Agency, and of course, in addition to being chair and vice chair, she serves on numerous ministry-based committees. As an educator, uh, she's had a very distinguished career, served as a university professor, a department chairperson, Kentucky State University, assistant dean, University of Louisville, for alma mater, the academic vice president at Oakwood College, now Oakwood University, and then provost and academic vice president at La Sierra University. To keep her hands in academics, and, and once, you've, once you've been smitten by it, you can't get away from it. She serves on dissertation committees at various universities as a way to give back. And those students with whom uh, she work and on whose committee she serve are blessed to have her there because she, she is really uh, an inspiration and provides real meaningful and deep feedback and insights. Maybe she would say, maybe the crowning glory, the crowning jewel of a distinguished career is that she is a mother and a grandmother. I've yes. heard her become a grandparent. Nothing, nothing beats that. I'm willing to find out. And a great grandmother as well. She's married to Nod Simmons, who is a retired teacher and business owner. Dr. Simmons, we're happy to have you. I should be joined with by Dr. Lisa Beersley Hardy. Now, Dr. Hardy earned her doctorate from the University of Hawaii in Manoa, United States. An MPA from La Belinda University and an MBA from Claremont Graduate University. And a budding theologian of BAs in theology from IS in the Philippines. She is the first woman to be elected as a director of education at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Quite an accomplishment. British by birth, uh, of Finnish and Japanese parents, but she holds multiple citizenships, Finland and the USA in addition to her British nationality. She has been an educator, an administrator, at all levels, primary, secondary, tertiary, and both public and private universities. Uh, because of her role on the GCS Department of Education, she has served on over 100 accreditation visits, quite a bit. And she chairs the AAA, which is the accrediting body of the General Conference. And she has oversight of a slew of Adventist colleges, universities, and K-12 schools. We have over 6,600 primary schools, over 2,700 secondary schools, over 37 or so vocational schools, and 118 colleges and universities, with a total enrollment of over 2 million students so that keeps her very busy. Uh, at one point, Dr. Bersley Hardy was the graduate dean at Andrews University. And as a recovering graduate dean myself, I can say that that might be the best job one can have. She has provided spiritual care as a healthcare chaplain at Lakeland Medical Center, in St. Joseph, Michigan, down the street from us. And her clinical pastoral education was at the Methodist Medical Center in Illinois. And she holds the ecclesiastical endorsements from the NAD, or church organization, and the GC, and is an associate chaplain in healthcare and an educational chaplain. She's a member of the Spencerville Seventh Adventist Church and is proud to mention to us that she's a Sabbath school teacher. And she reminds us that Sabbath school is the church's oldest school. Mm -hmm. 
The Hardy has over 70 publications focusing on education and health and faith and learning. She's married to the Dr. Frank Julia Hardy, and they have a daughter and two grandchildren. It's my honor, my joy, my pleasure to ask them to share with us this evening two daughters of Apprentice University, Dr. Lisa Bersley Hardy and Dr. Ella Simmons. Welcome and please share with us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arthur. Um, it is a delight always to be with our colleagues, our friends at Andrews University, our family, as you have said. Uh, we often say to each other and to others that we miss the academic environment and all that it brings. We are so caught up in administration and leadership that takes us in many different directions. So this is a treat when we have an opportunity to do what you've asked us to do this evening. We know that the time is short. So probably I think Dr. Beersley Hardy will control the uh, the PowerPoint, but if you will give her the opportunity to share screen, we're just going to go right into um, a brief presentation that you've asked us to prepare to sort of set the context for questions and the discussion. And we recognize and appreciate your theme, your title, Research for Decision Makers. Uh, this is so very important to us. And sometimes, um, and this is not a criticism, this is just description of perspective, but sometimes when we are in the room with a group of our colleagues, Dr. Beardsley Hardy and I sort of look at each other and wonder, are we the only ones thinking like we are thinking? And you understand where we're coming from, but others do not always approach the business of planning, evaluation of uh, administrative decisions uh, in ways that those who have academic experience approach them. So with this, we will quickly affirm <laughs> your uh, session structure. And uh, Dr. Beardsley Hardy, please, if you will just um, roll the screen, we will, we will go right through and try to stay within our are 30 minutes. Um, you see that the structure is the same. You're familiar with this. And so we're going to share with you our experiences with strategic planning at the General Conference. We both serve on the Strategic Planning Committee and of course have worked with many boards as you've heard, many boards and committees on strategic planning. So the next slide shows that um, our theme, our title, <laughs> indeed our mantra is, I will go. And so you'll see this if you haven't seen it somewhere, you will certainly see it somewhere along the way. But as we go to the next slide, I want to interject something. I was in a, a retirement seminar uh, not long ago, and the presenter said this, that he had picked it up somewhere and didn't try to own it as his own or even to give citation. Uh, but he said, hope is not strategy. Now we are people of the blessed hope. We are people of hope and faith. Yet, yet we know that we have to be specific and strategic in what we do, even for accomplishing the goals of the church. So moving on, I want to share with you some of the language in the description of the strategic plan. And you can just go right on, Dr. Beersley Hardy. Uh, if you go to the uh, GC website, you will see some of these words. Now, of course, we're focusing tonight on using research data for strategic planning. And uh, this research data to which uh, the message refers are the data uh, from the research that is surveys and focus groups and uh, yes some individual interviews for perspective and so forth and I certainly would say uh, the examination of documents particularly minutes and all of that that have gone into what we call the research page or our strategic plan. And so we declare right up front that this is a research based uh, document um, that uh, the data were used to identify objectives for the worldwide church uh, to accomplish its mission is, is the way we've structured this. You should hear more about this uh, next week when Dr. David Trim comes. Dr. Trim serves as the 
secretary for the strategic planning committee. And of course, you know, that means he carries the load, but he can give you all of the details on this. And so because we knew he was coming, we stepped back off of some of the details, but we want to give you uh, some context. Now, um, it is interesting. Um, I felt, and, and many have, would see immediately that just declaring what we have declared that the I will go, the strategic plan objectives focused in three areas, by the way, mission, spiritual growth, and leadership, with a fourth that is all, not always listed, that leaves room for the Holy Spirit to guide and direct in something that perhaps we haven't thought about. But just this is enough for you to see clearly, right up front, the dilemmas uh, in trying to codify or to quantify or even to describe in qualitative terms what we want from our research base, uh, I should say guided by our research base and what we expect to see, but how do we measure mission, accomplishment of mission or engagement in mission? Because I will go is all about the total member involvement effort. So how do we do that? Do we start counting numbers again? You know, in church, you raise your hand if you did such and such this week. I don't know, a spiritual growth, how do we measure that? And leadership, what is it? Uh, what do we want and how do we measure that? But we're talking about uh, in this session, uh, using research data for decision-making for solving, or I'll say later, resolving dilemmas. And um, of course, we say that these were created, these categories, these objectives were created to set tangible goals and action plans. And of course, I want you to, to get this last bullet point, we say, and you know, I'm using the term we generically, the, the world church says, this is more than a strategic plan. So that tells you something about our thinking. So what is it and why must it be more? We're saying it's a mission focused tool based on real data, that is our research, and the Great Commission. Well, there's another dilemma, right? So how do we balance uh, that research base, the, the research guided, data guided decisions, uh, and I certainly won't say versus, but along with or balance with scripture. So, you can see what we're up against even as we go. The next slide shows um, the reach the world. And I'll mention that reach the world is part of the title because there was some criticism about the GC changing, changing every five years at least, changing too often when the people in the field wanted to be able to know where we're going, what's expected of them and to follow uh, the same path, so to speak. So reach the world, uh, being presented here visibly is to help people realize uh, the alignment or the continuation of the central thrust of the world church for reaching the world. And here we're saying for this uh, 2020 to 2025, this five year, or this quinquennium, I will go being the, the focus, the specific focus. And I won't go into all of this, but uh, I think, um, I, I would say that uh, one thing that you should be aware of, I suppose, this uh, highlighted area, and then I'll make a comment, it's about the whole church, we say, church members, local churches, missions, conferences, unions, divisions, and so forth. And it says it outlines, again, specific objections, objectives, <laughs> and ways to accomplish these tasks. The church works together as a worldwide team of brothers and sisters. Now, um, we, we, we say that, we, that this whole thing is research-based and, and I'm not disagreeing, but understanding uh, your perspective, I would emphasize that we have given keen focus on the current general conference uh, supported research, the data from, from those studies to the apparent exclusion of data and uh, knowledge from the broader research literature that uh, we did not go to those ends in our research perspective. The next slide, I just want to set a quick bit of context before Dr. Beersley Hardy comes with some specifics 
on how we actually work through the strategic planning process. And she's going to look at how this was done for educators. But I'm looking from, I guess, a sociological, and yet, you know, we have to always know theological perspectives. But I, um, I went back to some of my research base uh, from and, and my teaching base from when I was in the academy. And uh, some of it's been updated. Some of it is, you'll find, as we like to say, still the classical pieces. Uh, but look at this, even in the best of times, educational leaders have confronted difficult moral dilemmas every day, not just when there's a pandemic or a, when there's something wrong or something monumental happening, but each and every day. Each administrative decision carries with it a restructuring of human life. That is why administration at its heart is the resolution of moral dilemmas. Now, I, I had about five different quotes that, that say, you know, what we do as administrators and leaders has a ripple effect for good or not so good. Leaders are constantly being asked to provide once and for all answers to big problems that are complex, rife with paradoxes and dilemmas. And the next slide. Uh, kind of sets a context for where I would like to see, and we would hope to see some of this conversation go, but we will see um, the figure, and I've just uh, borrowed this from Shapiro and Gross, uh, ethical educational leadership in turbulent times. And I'm not sure if it's coming up right, but we'll see, it's the, um, it's the Venn diagram, the blue, uh, Venn diagram, the next one, it shows that we would, we, would we would pursue or we would engage in decision making from various perspectives. And there might be the ethic of justice, you know, the rules, regulations, and so forth, the policies, but then there's the ethic of care that focuses on the individual within that. And this may uh, make sense when we, when we pose our uh, dilemma, you'll see how all of this comes into play. The ethic of the profession. What do we, what do you as educational leaders, um, uh, let's say, how do you as educational leaders decide what is ethical behavior for you? And uh, just kind of think about the, um, uh, the uh, disciplines and the professional societies and guilds that have a standard for behavior within your uh, chosen area of service. And then the ethic of critique that questions all of it. We say we believe this, but we do this. What is it that we really believe? And it, it leads us to analyze, to critique policy, whether they are as they should be for the care of all, for the uh, guidance, the right kind of guidance in the profession. And I looked at educational leaders, but of course, pastors and church leaders and the ethic of, of justice. So moving on, I don't want to say too much more about this, but this theoretical framework can help us to think about this. Uh, the work of decision-making in turbulent times, but in any time uh, requires the leader to bring together uh, two minds, and we see this in scripture. Um, we can look at Paul's writings and we see the heart and the head and, and that, uh, that dilemma, or at least that tug. Uh, and Paul even poses the ultimate dilemma, uh, that of the human condition. So we, we have to grapple with all of these and we have to rely on all. So as we're using research, we must also engage the spiritual understandings, um, the heart and the head. And then the next uh, slide, please. I don't want to go too much, but um, into this. So I'll just kind of skip that one, I believe. The point is being made, we, we have to bring them alongside each other to give the full range of understanding for engaging in decision making and solving dilemmas. And then the next slide might help by just typically in academics, we're going to focus on theories for decision making, the research and the data for decision making, but in the church, no matter where we serve in the church, even educational leaders, we have to think theory and theology 
for decision making. And we certainly would um, look <laughs> at uh, the vast diversity of the worldwide church and, and, and try to apply the theory and the theology, but that again uh, causes a little tug there, some dilemma. But in any case, we need to provide, provide relevant predictions as we engage in decision-making, um, explanations to this vast uh, membership, interpretations to the vast membership, and applications and looking at applications as being those that can come from multiple uh, directions. So uh, the next slide, the Seventh-day Adventist plan, I will go strategic plan for the years 2020 to 2025 outlines 10 objectives. It's divided into three categories, mission, spiritual growth, leadership, all of which we have tried to research from various aspects to develop a database that would guide decision-making for uh, the movement, forward movement of the church and for assessing uh, what we would like to believe is the growth and development of the church. So with this, I'm going to uh, turn over to Dr. Beersley Harding, who will literally walk us through what she has done with the educators worldwide. Dr. Thank, you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. Dr. Simmons has been addressing strategy and strategy is that overarching plan and, and set of goals. I'm going to focus on tactics, which are the specific actions and steps that we took here in the Department of Education on how we are going to reach the strategy of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I Will Go is the overall strategy with three areas, as Dr. Simmons already outlined, and a fourth one, which is leaving room for action by the Holy Spirit, because we can look at global data, we can look at global indicators, we can measure them, but we cannot outplan what God has in mind. Who could have thought a year and a half ago that COVID would turn our world upside down? And it has affected everything, education, how we do church, how we live our personal lives. And so we want to keep that openness to however the Holy Spirit is going to lead us. We can't have such a waterproof strategy that we lock out the Holy Spirit. The specific focus was what is the role of education? You heard from Dr. Kristen Arthur some of the overall statistics of over 9,000 schools, over 110,000 teachers, and over 2 million students. So how do we marshal this resource that the church has? How do we utilize its structure and its employees to achieve the strategic focus? This plan was voted by the International Board of Education and the International Board of Ministerial and Theological Education just uh, a couple months ago on April 1. And no, that was no joke. I see Dr. Gilbert Wari on here. Dr. Wari, great to see you. He was a member of both of these bodies at some time, and he knows that this is an important platform by which the World Church comes together as a global entity to identify what its main uh, goals will be and an approval process for new institutions and new programs. So how do we move forward in the context of great cultural and religious diversity? The goals were clear, the key performance indicators are clear, but we live in a highly diverse world. How will our schools be part of tactically helping us achieve the strategic plan. The first step that we did was to have a meeting on July 7 and 8, 2020. First, I should back up and say that the strategic plan I Will Go was launched one year ago on July 3, 2020. And it was telecast, it was on YouTube, it was on um, on uh, Facebook, it was on Hope Channel and, and other fora. That's when it was launched. 
And just less than a week after that, education met together for two days. This was the Global Education Advisory. It represented all 13 world divisions. It also had representation from the Middle East, North Africa Union Conference, and the China Union, uh, China Union Mission. It included the divisions, these 13 divisions, unions, represented conferences, universities, and schools. And each of these entities, these various layers of the organization will vary as to what is of highest priority given their unique mission and opportunities. We reviewed every single objective and every single key performance indicator. And we ranked and rated them using Zoom. We set up polls in advance, which made it easier to achieve that so that we could go through them and vote and uh, tabulate those results. Then the following month on August 4, 2020, we had a day long meeting with university presidents, about 100 and over 100 presidents. And we had more than 100, had 142 because we included the academic vice presidents, division directors of education, each division has a director of education. And it included some presenters for an advisory for university presidents. That end was 142 individuals. And that using Zoom again, we ranked the key performance indicators and objectives that were rated to be of global priority that tertiary education is positioned to fulfill, not primary education, not secondary education. But the question is, what are you as universities, Andrews University, what are you positioned to be able to fulfill? Then we had one more meeting that was a couple months ago, April 1, 2021, where again, we had to meet by Zoom rather than face-to-face -face as we normally do with two bodies, the board of the International Board of Education, Dr. Simmons chairs that, and the International Board of Ministerial and Theological Education, that's chaired by Jeffrey Mbwana, and that included the division presidents of all 13 divisions, as well as educational experts. Uh, Dr. Elaine Thorpe, I saw she was on there in the past. She has been one of those individuals representing globally education. And we reviewed those KPIs that were ranked number one of highest priority and number two of secondary priority in all divisions and attached fields in the quinquennium ending 2025. In addition, we recognize that there may be other key performance indicators that a certain part of the world or a certain institution may wish to engage in and measure. We are not restricting what institutions or individuals would like to do, but there was uh, the purpose of this was to achieve consensus on what are we going to do globally as educators, what will we focus on? Now in the next uh, three slides, I will review with you what those key performance indicators are verbatim from the strategic plan, what they are and, why, and you'll see uh, that these were all rated as number one of highest priority by educators who represented primary, secondary, and tertiary education by university presidents as well in that second meeting. And the number K, KPI 1.1, that's simply a way to find it in the overall strategic plan. KPI 1.1 was rated as number one, and I'm simply going to read it with you. An increased number of church members participating in both personal and public evangelistic outreach initiatives with a goal of TMI, that is total member involvement. Our schools and our universities, our secondary schools are also spiritual homes. Every one of our schools are associated with a church and with outreach to the community. So the educators at all levels said, 
we are in a position to mobilize church members to participate in personal and public evangelism and outreach initiatives. 2.10 was each conference and mission will have a five-year plan to increase the number of Adventist primary and secondary schools. For instance, in the Euro-Asia division last quinquennium, their goal was to open 50 new schools an ambitious goal, and they were maybe just one or two schools short of achieving that goal. These are the former Soviet countries. 4.2, Adventist tertiary institutions will increase the proportion of missiologists teaching mission, all of whom are faithful to biblical missional principles, are Adventist educated and are endorsed. That is, they have a certification by the International Board of Ministerial and theological education. 4.3, each institution will report to its own board of governing or governing committee on how it will achieve selected objectives and KPIs of the I Will Go plan. This was ranked number two by university presidents, but ranked as number one by the global education team. 5.2, continuing with those ranked of highest priority, a significant increase in the number of church members and unbaptized children and youth regularly attending divine service and Sabbath school. This was seen as a priority and you know right there at Andrews University how important PMC is to the life of the campus and the other chapels that meet on campus. And that is true for our universities and schools around the world. Our educational system is positioned to increase regular attendance in divine service and Sabbath school. 5.3, significant increase in acceptance and practice of the church's distinctive beliefs, especially creation, salvation by grace, understanding of the state of the dead, understanding of the role of the remnant church, of healthful living, of the doctrine of the sanctuary and the judgment, this doctrine of the second coming and the nature of the fundamental beliefs as a whole as Bible-centered doctrines that reflect a loving, gracious God. All of our schools teach Bible in one way or another, appropriate to the level of the student. 5.9, an increased number of children from Adventist homes and churches attending Adventist schools. Continuing with those rated of highest priority that the global educational system agreed this is what we'll focus on in the next five years, and evidence of greater unity and community among church members, of reduced conflict in local churches, and of an active commitment to zero tolerance of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. Our schools are also residential communities with dormitories, and we are positioned to model healthy communities with zero tolerance for physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. 6.8, improved, improved retention rates of young adults, youth, and unbaptized children based on the collection of specific statistics on those groups. And 7.1, Bible classes that teach the historical grammatical method and historicist approach to the study of prophecies that engender confidence in the Bible as divine revelation that foster trust in God and commitment to his mission. And these are the final ones that were rated globally by educators as of highest priority, 7.2, that youth and young adults embrace the belief that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, abstaining from alcohol, recreational use of drugs, and other high-risk behaviors, and embrace church teachings on marriage and demonstrate sexual purity. 7.3, increased ethical and responsible use of media platforms by students, and 8.1, evidence that most pastors and teachers feel supported by church members and by conference administrators, continue to feel called to ministry and are engaging in continuing education and development. The final one that was rated of highest priority by educators is openness to the Holy Spirit to Holy Spirit-led objectives to be defined as the Spirit leads during the next quinquennium. Those that 
globally were rated as number two, which meant an approval rating of more, at least 50% of the group said this is of secondary importance. 8.2, pastors with limited Seventh-day Adventist education are working to complete coursework necessary to meet their local board of ministerial and theological education requirements and that teachers would be certified. And 9.5, that the general conference has and its entities are working towards an integrated media plan that maximizes the potential of technology. And that would include for us instructional and classroom management software. And I wish we'd done this last year before COVID hit because so many schools have been impaired because it did not have adequate instructional and classroom management software. And 10.4, that divisions annually report progress in achieving the objectives and KPIs of the I Will Go plan, both via an online form with standardized summative information and by presentation at each annual council. So those are the primary and secondary objectives that the World Educational Network had said, this is what we're going to focus on. In addition to everything else we do, in addition to some cultural specific things that we might do, in addition to responding to unexpected, unanticipated opportunities when the Holy Spirit leads us, but as a global network, we are going to focus on these primary and secondary KPIs and we commit to assessing them, measuring them, and reporting on them. Now we go back to Dr. Simmons. Thank you. Uh, now you ask us not only to talk about how we use the research data to um, make decisions in the world church. We gave you the, the big picture for, with the strategic plan, but even within the plan, and as you said, just as with educators, Every day, all the time, we're solving dilemmas. We're making decisions about the uh, that that have their roots in the past, usually that are that are tugging at us currently, and that have eternal uh, implications for the future. And I'm not just talking about heaven. I, I'm talking about how we live and engage and how we are to be the people we're called to be and to do what God expects of us. I'm going to, on the next slide, just, just hit something quickly and then uh, set up the dilemma. And I'll go back to Dr. Beasley Hardy in a moment. But as I thought back, uh, again, looking at what, what my experience has been as an educational leader in, um, uh, in the schools, and also uh, in the academy, and then uh, teaching those who are, or at least facilitating the learning of those who are educational leaders. Um, I, I fell back on something here, and we can just kind of hit these, uh, hit the second bullet point, but solving or resolving moral dilemmas. You know, there was a, a time when it was just a popular thing to, to put up a case study and we talk about, you know, should we blow the bridge or, or let the train pass and all of these kinds of things. But, but really, let's think about this. Every day, we have to think and make decisions, solve the dilemma between general security and civil liberties, for example. Now, we probably won't say much about that one, although that's near and dear to my heart, especially right now, as we're trying to engage in more um, uh, robust conversation about these kinds of things. But there's always that tension. And just think, people in, in my home state, for example, Kentucky, are just up in arms, almost. A few of them, literally, uh, because they've been asked to wear masks. So, uh, you know, we're talking about the physical health security of the nation versus the civil liberties of an individual to make that decision. But putting that aside, but I just want to bring us back to that before we talk about this. But now power versus accommodation, that certainly is alive and well in the church and everywhere else. Community standards versus individual rights, the same. Equality versus equity personal vision versus authority, rules, regulations, and policies versus in the, the individual, but we're looking at culture, 
for this particular dilemma. So Dr. Beardsley Hardy, let's let me just read this. And, and then I, um, we have some guiding questions, but just to get it before us, I'll let you talk a little bit or engage a little bit, but I'd also like to get to some of our questions if, if we can as well. But here it is. Um, and we could have chosen many, but uh, this one is one that we wanted to share with you. The state of the dead. Uh, you heard Dr. Grizzly Hardy uh, share those uh, priority uh, objectives and KPIs. Well, this comes out of one significant increase in acceptance and practice of the church's distinctive beliefs. Now, especially, as she said, creation. And you see that FB, somebody said they're glad it's not Facebook, right? It's fundamental belief for Adventists. Just as TMI is not too much information for Adventists, it's total member involvement. So we have our own thing going here. But salvation by faith. But here it is, state of the dead and power of prayer. And see how specific we were here over witchcraft and spiritualism. And I won't go into all of this, but we're going to focus on that one because um, what we're finding from the research base is that many of our members still believe in, shall I say, life after death in some state or form, uh, in the power of uh, witches and warlocks, uh, and those in certain countries. And we always look to Africa and Asia, but um, also think about in the United States and Europe, most people, it seems these days, but certainly many get up each day and consult the horoscope rather than scripture. And uh, if you look at Disney movies, for example, I, I just can't believe some of the things that are coming out. We see spiritualism and witchcraft and all of that throughout all of this. So this is worldwide, but we focus on those who are um, uh, more transparent in their practices. And these would be those who, who consult um, the, the witch doctors and, and those others. So now how do we handle that as church leaders is, is the dilemma because you know we believe the Bible says the dead don't know anything. So how do we handle the thing when members of the world church in good and regular standing consult their long deceased ancestors, for example? And I'm, I'm not answering that, I'm throwing that out as our dilemma. And um, um, some guiding questions quickly. We don't have to go through all of these, but we really want to get to your questions. But if I were, uh, if I were moving in on the track that we've established, I would want you to engage uh, around those ethical dilemmas. As I looked at the ethic of justice, care, uh, the profession, and uh, critique. Which ethical paradigm do you think would most uh, accurately, most closely align with the dilemma that we have set for you for you today? Um, someone's trying to reach me. I'm sorry, of all times, and uh, I should have turned this off. Uh, what is the most appropriate? Uh, I'll say, you know, this is just by confession. You would never have known it was my phone, but there's something natural now that makes me want to confess when I'm the violator on a Zoom. <laughs> what is the most appropriate action to take within the ethic of the profession that is ministry of church leadership or education in this regard? Because we still have to rely on educators to turn the tide on these things, but what should church leaders do right now in order to have those things happen? Which considerations for, eth it says, for ethnic and cultural differences, how, however you want to uh, uh, describe this, how can or should the ethic of care affect the decisions and actions of church leaders? Uh, we're talking a bit more about that these days, but still not much. And then what does the ethic of critique reveal about this dilemma and the larger problems facing the church surrounding it? Uh, do we have, you know, blind eyes in one area and eyes wide open and pointing fingers in another? Uh, do we see the, the, full, the big picture clearly? What ethical paradigm would you apply to this dilemma? At, 
I actually turned it off. Would you apply to this dilemma if you, you were the GC decision makers today and how would you apply it? So Dr. Beersley Hardy, I want to go to you and then you can help to lead us into the questions that our hosts have for us this evening. Yes. If you would like to get more information about the Quinquennial Strategic Plan, you can point your iPhone to the image on the screen or go to IWillGo2020.org. It is in multiple languages, English, Spanish, Portuguese, and French are our core languages, but it is also available in Russian and Mandarin and some other languages. As the other languages become available, they're uploaded to that site. So you can see it in more detail. But Dr. Simmons now has posed some questions to you, or you may have some of your own and we welcome your questions. Well, I want to thank you both ladies, um, Drs. Um, Simmons and Dr. Um, Beersley Harding for not only articulating and walking us through the quinquennial strategic plan, but helping us see it. I think for me, as I heard both ladies present this evening, it was more than a group of people just sit together and decide this is what we're choosing. It's very intentional, it's very focused, it's measurable, and it was exciting to see the thinking behind the planning and so forth. So thank you for the gift of your time this evening and for walking us through this process. Dr. Simmons, I was especially struck by your statement very early on where you took the work of Dr. Shapiro and Gross and you had the quote on, even in the best of times, educational leaders have confronted moral dilemmas. And my question to you, either one can answer that question this evening, but my question is, as you look at church ministry and as you look at educational leadership ministry, because both, are, both go hand in hand, in your opinion, what do you consider, based on your experiences, our greatest moral dilemma mm. as a church? That, that is major. I will begin and allow Dr. Beardsley Hardy to think a moment, and then as she speaks, maybe I'll think of something else as well. But our greatest moral dilemma, um, I'm going to speak for myself, uh, not for the World Church, and I'm always reminded that just because, you know, the position I hold, um, when I speak, uh, it at least sheds light, and some say cast shadows, on the world church itself and its, uh, its leaders. But I, I think in all honesty, I think the greatest dilemma is this wonderful articulation of 28 fundamental beliefs, clearly spelled out. And I would say uh, perhaps the gap between um, our living, being living demonstrations of those very well articulated fundamental beliefs. And um, we could run down through those uh, if you wanted to get me in real deep hot water. But, um, but if you, you think of any of the 28 and the dilemma we pose, it comes in there uh, with one of them, but we have some greater than those. Number six, God created all of us in his image. Um, if you just, my inference should be clear. Mm -hmm. uh, number seven, the nature of human beings. Um, number 14, on equality that we, we spell out so beautifully but we don't always live that out. And, um, and then I think it's, uh, what is it, 11 or 12, that talks about relationships within the church. I would want us, and, and I love this church and I love the leaders. I love my brothers and sisters in the church. What I'm saying, the same thing that I would say for my family, the Simmons, I would want all of our neighbors to look at us and we like to say, and see Jesus. So what does that mean? Look at us and, and develop an understanding of each of those fundamental beliefs simply 
by observing us and interacting with us. If they were asked to describe us, they would use that same language without ever seeing those fundamental beliefs in print, but only through seeing us and interacting with us. Thank you. Dr. Beersley Hardy, I yes. have a question. Well, mine is much more uh, down at the, at the live reality, and, and that is those, there are so many who want to go to a Seventh-day Adventist school and don't have the money to do that. And we are a private system. We don't receive funding from tax money. The uh, working policy does allow for a certain portion of tithe even to be used to support the education system. But the, that, that doesn't, it doesn't get the money that it should. And while I fully agree that, that teachers should work for sacrificial wages, they should not sacrifice their own family on that altar either. They need to earn. So we have to find a balance of supporting Adventist education and making it accessible to those without means. At one time, we had wonderful work study programs and that enable and, and canvassing programs that enabled young people who are willing to work. And even if it took them longer to get done, they could, they could earn and learn. We've lost that in many places. I won't name the school. We were on accreditation visit at one place. One school had beautiful grounds, wonderful grounds. And as we were walking around campus, I noticed that the work was being done by a, a, a minority group in that country, people of color. And the students did not, they didn't have a work study program at all. And I just uh, thought to myself, what this school is teaching them is that people of color are the, one, the ones that do the menial labor of emptying trash cans and cutting the grass. And if you are majority and uh, white, I'll just go ahead and say it, if you're white, then you, your job is just to be white collar. And the, the tuition was high because we didn't have a work study program. And I felt like we'd sold out to some of our own philosophy. So the question was posted here about the schools shrinking. And in North America, that is true, but in much of the world, it is booming. We have schools, DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo and East Central Africa, we, that has more schools than any other place. And the state of some of these schools are really, really, really modest. The teachers sacrifice, they work hard and still they struggle. So I think we need a better funding model. I think our churches need to recognize the importance of education as a ministry and be willing to support it and not just do straight out evangelism, but recognize that the ministry of education is the ministry of restoring the image of God in students and it is worthy of investing in. In some parts of the world, education schools are the best means that we have of, of contributing to society and to the young people in the former Soviet countries and some of the, the places like DRC, we have tremendous opportunities. And I wish we as a church could, could uh, address that. And I think that's a moral issue because it affects the, the young, the ones that are not able to speak for themselves. Along those lines, just one more thing, let's take the country of Djibouti, Muslim country, um, Who's going to speak for Djibouti? There is no church there. There's a tiny little group that meets there at the clinic, but there's nobody to advocate for them. Who is going to speak for those that have no voice? Uh, and that is uh, the moral issue that, that I think affects, uh, at least where I live, what I care, what, what I care about uh, most deeply. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Lesma, let me, let me just tie on to that. As I said, I probably would. Uh, <laughs> actually, Dr. Beardsley Hardy's example is just perfect uh, example of what I was saying. Uh, we speak so highly of education and its value. And Dr. Beardsley Hardy and I agree uh, exactly with what she has said. And uh, yet we as a church we say, and all your children shall be taught of the Lord, shall, shall be taught in Seventh-day Adventist church schools. Yet those 
those children, those young people who have access are those whose parents can afford it or who have the wisdom or both the wisdom and the funds to send them. But we as a church, an entire church are responsible. So if we really believe what we say, as Dr. Bisley Hardy is saying, we would have all Seventh-day Adventist young people in Seventh-day Adventist schools provided everywhere in the world. And we would see our schools as our first line of evangelism, not only for young people, but for their families and communities as well. I'd like to comment on Dr. Bob Gardner's observation regarding witchcraft and spiritualism. And what you say there is uh, right on target. The, the regions of the world where the, there is the greatest um, inconsistency, I would say, in, in doctors saying, yes, the, the dead are dead, uh, but then holding conflicting views, it's okay to go to witch doctors, it's okay, it, you, you can speak to the deceased relatives, are regions of the world where it is either polytheistic or there are, there, there's a very active spiritual world. Um, my half of my family, as you heard, is Japanese. So on, on that side, the Buddhist side, there's a very, very active spiritual world and you have to do things on certain times after the death and so on to keep the spirits um, appeased and not having bad things happen to you. So the church in those countries reflects ambient culture. We are, we, we, we are not of operating in vacuums. And in many of those parts of the world, the church is young. So there are many new converts and it, it takes time to reconcile a cognitive assent to a doctrine to some of the experiences that you point out here, Dr. Baumgarten, some deeply personal things, illness and death and fear. And, and so on. And this is why education is so important. Where Education is not a two week evangelistic bombastic thing where you just sort of go after people with doctrine, but it is that lived experience as you walk with young people and families as they go through the various stages and phases of their life, experiencing joys and griefs and bereavement. And in that supportive community over time, they grow into a, a visceral uh, appreciation of, of the freedom that we have in Christ and, and, and not needing to fear, for instance. I have one aunt where I, uh, Buddhist aunt, where I had uh, picked a night blooming cereus. It's a blossom that only blooms for one night. And I wondered if I picked it and put it in a glass of water and took it home, whether or not it would still bloom in the next day if it would die. So I, so I did that. And if you've ever put your hand inside a night blooming series, it's the softest thing you could imagine. It's like touching a soft tummy of a, of a squirrel. It's a soft, wonderful feeling. So I had this in the glass to see what would happen. And I reported to my aunt, my experiment. Well, she was really worried that something bad was going in. I had disturbed the spirits over this thing. And she genuinely was fearful. We forget about that if we have grown in faith, that we don't have to fear this, this malevolent spirit world that is just kind of waiting to pounce on you by not doing something at the right time and, the, and, and in the right way. But it takes time to settle into that assurance of the freedom that is ours in Christ. And education is a means by which that happens over years. Well, I just like to say this was absolutely stunning. Uh, just it was it's been wonderful to hear uh, that each of you have been involved with this and the extent to which data has been like this wasn't just a bunch of people saying what should we do? This was really trying to get a a consent a broad global consensus and so like I'm just I'm at awe watching all of this. So fantastic. Really love this. Uh, I, I, I had some questions. I'm going to stop those because the questions inside of the chat room. Uh, Dr. Brand, can you bring just a couple of questions as we try to draw this to a conclusion? Some, please. Well, sure. Um, yeah. Sharon asks a, a very uh, challenging question, and I'm sure that... Um, 
either of our speakers, perhaps both, uh, could uh, have you know thought about it quite a bit. But to what extent is is our church's global educational strategy and educational strategy in particular, but certainly other initiatives as well? Do we think at all about integrating those with the UN's global initiatives and priorities and strategies? So. To what extent would you consider the mission of our church to be informed by and aligned with uh, the UN's global priorities? Dr. Beardsley Hardy, you should take that first. We can't hear you. You're I'm sorry, some parts, some parts of the world are much more aligned with that and reference that more. So they'll say this aligns with SDG goal, this particular in areas of of women and women's education and um, access for, uh, for boys and girls, but it's variable. I, I don't hear that here in North America, but I, I do hear it in, in Africa. Uh -huh. The last time I attended a UN meeting, one of the high level meetings on topics such as this, and I was really following uh, those goals very closely uh, there were a few Seventh-day Adventists uh, present. Some were leaders in various nations and thereby were present. Others uh, were part of the church proper and were there representing what they're doing uh, from their uh, local, uh, semi-local uh, church level. But um, there is no organized, official, formal alignment uh, with those goals. Some of us use them, bring them before us when we can, um, but I'm sorry to say there really is no formal connection. Well, I, you know, I, I thank you for that. I, I think probably all of us uh, to a certain extent recognize that there will probably always be a certain tension uh, within our community between, um, you know, theological orthodoxy and practice, uh, you know, relevance in meeting the needs within the real world. Uh, there are immediate perspectives, immediate, and, and from a human perspective, it's very difficult to get your arms around both of those priorities, um, you know, mm -hmm. particularly on a moment by moment basis. Right. If I may say, uh, ADRA, our um, development and relief agency, has done some work of a formal and official nature, but they have not tried to, um, again, bridge the gap to the traditional uh, ministries of the church, but they, they actually have had officials in, they have trained on those goals, they have uh, measured themselves by those goals and so forth. Good. Well, I, you know, we are coming to the end of our time together and we're going to need to hand off in just a moment. Uh, I, I would like to just ask a quick question uh, and it has to do with scale and, you know, what, what you ladies have presented uh, from the general conference of Seventh-day Adventist, this, the, the global perspective of trying to, to see a, a mission of a, of a, you know, and what what's seen as an end time church, a church uh, coming to the close of Earth's history, and and saying, how do we organize a global? How do we do this? That's like it's hard to comprehend, and and yet the the simplicity with how you've laid it out with the you know the KPIs, the key performance indicators, and laid this has been helping to really clarify the process as well has been really helpful. So the, the question would be this, uh, at a local school, at, at a local business, uh, I, I'm assuming you would think that these same principles would be scalable. Uh, um, is that, would you see something like that and expect, you know, when you go to visit a school, a university or or an academy or elementary school, I, I, you're probably not doing as much of that, but um, are those same principles 
scalable where you can go out and gather information and use that? And, and who ends up making the decision and owning it? Does everybody own it or is it really owned by the, the leadership team? Um, Dr. Beardsley Hardy, you may want to speak from um, on that, but I, I want to say a word on what we do with our institutions, Andrews being one. Yes. Um, uh, I, I'm just was writing in the chat and Janet, Janet had the other half of your question there, Dr. Siebel, and mm -hmm. that is how do you, how, how closely can you monitor? I would love it if this would be like a car, you step on the gas and you see you're going from 50 to 55 <laughs> and, and then you let up or you turn right, you turn left. I wish it were that responsive. And um, we, we, we don't have that. We do collect data, but that global church survey happens every five years. Then there are smaller surveys. So we have to rely on proxy measures. So uh, an indicator of educational effectiveness, for instance, one proxy measure that we use is the number of schools that are accredited by AAA. When we have the accreditation, we do look at some nuts and bolts things, but it, it's just a proxy for us achieving quality Adventist education. I think um, where we are as a global church, we are taking a picture uh, every, every five years and not every six months or not even every eight month at, at this level where we are. I hope as our ability to collect data and as a church, we've moved much more in the digital. And I mentioned that for Zoom, for our rating, we use polling. This was fabulous. We were able to get results globally, boom, 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 like that. Within the matter of one day, we could complete this and say for all of systems at all levels, what do you think is most important? That was phenomenal that we could do that. We mm -hmm. couldn't have done that pre-Zoom easily. And we could now, and I hope we will be able to, to do more of that. But in the meantime, we rely on some of these other proxy measures. Mm. We're, we're expecting uh, specific responses from all of our general conference institutions in their strategic planning processes. We're hoping that they are drawing on data that did not come through this data system that we have created and that maybe there's something a little more substantial um, uh, with some longevity to it. But we have not, um, characteristically, we have not done that. And I sort of alluded to that in the introductory remarks, just letting you know that we recognize that. So we have to be intentional, however. I'm hoping that when uh, David Trim comes to you next week, that he will give you some more specific detail and that also he will be able to share uh, some of the insights for going forward. Um, I, I have been... Um, uh, positively impressed, and I think you, Dr. Beasley Hardy, with the work done by our colleagues in the universities for data gathering, for um, engaging in whatever research project we've given them, they have taken it on as a scholarly effort, uh, but also as an effort for turning the tide on how we do things in the church. You know, theology is our base, no matter what, right. but right. that but not to the exclusion of real life, real time information, at least. Mm -hmm. Data, information, descriptive data, whatever. We, we must open our eyes and see around us as, as yes, we apply the, you know, our theological perspective to everything. Mm -hmm. Well, we have uh, uh, come to the end of our uh, time together. And I just really appreciate it. Uh, for Dr. Ledesma, this has been a wonderful experience for our colleagues. Um, one of the things, and by the way, uh, I noticed, Dr. Arthur, you're still here, uh, spirit-driven and data-informed. That's one of the things we talk about. Uh, so I appreciate your comments earlier. Uh, we're going to turn it back over to Dr. Board Henry Saturnay, the chair of the leadership department. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much, Dr. Sibold and Dr. Ledesma for leading and uh, uh, this conversation. Uh, in a few minutes, our own Dean, Dr. Alan Thorpe, 
from the School of the College of Education and International Service. She will share the, some closing remarks. But before that, I would like to, rem to remind all of us that this is number four, the number the fourth of our series of webinars on research for decision makers. We have a fifth one coming next week, and uh, the guest will be Dr. Trim. Would, would you like to tell us what we should expect for next week? Dr. Sibol or Dr. Um, yeah, Dr. Baumgartner, Baumgartner, can you give us uh, a brief overview, please? Well, we all know that Dr. Trim is a researcher turned archive uh, specialist at, the, uh, at uh, the General Conference, and he's in charge of all the statistics that are regularly collected about our membership, about our pastors, about tithes, and so on. And he has been on the forefront also to ask for more accountability with these numbers, especially in view of the membership. As a matter of fact, he was one who refused to publish data that were not audited, which is unheard of in our denomination. And so because of this courage, he has become known as a person that really takes data very seriously and wants it to be a tool that is sharpened uh, at the uh, so it can work well for our executive leaders. And so we were curious to, to, to bring him in here to, to, to talk to us a little bit about his experience, how he helped our denomination to be uh, more honest about our membership data and what this has done for our denomination. And so we are looking forward to a very interesting evening with him. He always has very interesting stories to tell and uh, gives us interesting perspectives of what is actually happening on the basis of these data, what he can tell us about our denomination and our church family. And so I invite you not only to come yourself, but to alert your friends and your colleagues that he will be here uh, to join us for an interesting evening for leaders so that we are more able to use data in the right way as decision makers. Thank you. And that will be next week, July 8th at 7 p.m. We're on the same Zoom uh, platform. But beyond this uh, series of seminar on research for decision makers, we have something special coming up in July. Every year we have the annual conference and this year we have Dr. Bettina von Stam from Germany who will present to us. And the theme for the whole annual conference and roundtable will be powering innovation through diversity and collaboration. Could you in a couple of minutes just tell us how exciting that will be to have that seminar and that will be in um, the last Monday of July. Uh, are you addressing that to me again? Yes, Dr. Bren, could you tell us a little bit about what Dr. Okay. Dr. Von, uh, von oh. Stam is going to present? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, I was um, privileged to have the opportunity to um, work in an international think tank on the future of work, and particularly uh, alternative ways of working outside of the office, uh, which, of course, in the last year, we have all sort of uh, mastered more or less uh, well. But anyway, within one of those meetings in uh, Stuttgart, Germany, actually, um, I met Bettina von Stamm for the first time. And she has built a stellar and influential career uh, on the issues of diversity, cross-cultural competence, collaboration, uh, and organizational innovation. Uh, and I, I'm quite confident that you'll find her as fascinating as I always have. Thank you. That will be July, Monday, July 26, uh, just in a few weeks coming out. At this point, I would like to invite our Dean, Dr. Thorpe, to please come forward and share our closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saturnay. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Arthur for being here with us tonight. But I especially want to thank both Dr. Simmons and Dr. Beardsley Hardy who have, um, I've known for quite a few years now, and who have um, 
always continue to share what is the best about Adventist education, but not, are not afraid to point to those things that we need to do better than we're doing them now. I also have really greatly appreciated the discussion um, tonight. And I, like uh, Dr. Beardsley Hardy, hope that this discussion and Dr. Simmons, that this discussion will continue. And one of the things I will say is that Andrews University is in the middle of a, of a strategic planning session. Dr. Arthur knows this very well. We've had a number of meetings about this in administration. And I have talked to faculty, to the faculty in the College of Education and International Services about our strategic plan. And I think this is almost a challenge for us tonight, isn't it? To look at how we might be able to align with the church, because it's very important. We can never forget that the basis for Adventist education has to be that redemptive part of Adventist yes. education that need to bring us all back to the reason we're here at all. And that is to pray, to bring other people, to bring young people, to bring for us in the College of Education, older people to the throne of God to let them realize how much more their lives can be enriched by building a tremendous faith relationship. So this is a challenge to us, but it's also a tremendous opportunity. And I wanna thank both Dr. Simmons and Dr. Beardsley Hardy for reminding us of that. Let's end with a word of prayer. So please bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for both the opportunity and the challenge that we have heard tonight and for the opportunity and challenge of working in an institution that is an Adventist educational institution where our primary mission is to bring people to you, to educate them, yes, to change the world, yes, but to change the world so that we all walk in the path that you would have us walk. Thank you so much for everyone who has attended tonight. We know that you have blessed. We ask that you will be with all of us now as we part and that you will continue to lead us down your path. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much for allowing us to participate with you. Oh, well, it's been a joy. Thank you.